Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Energy Policies Energy Leaders webinar series. I'm Bill Squadron, president of OEP, and we're delighted to have you here today for our discussion about energy, the grid, and security issues with General Wesley K. Clark. Um, we're going to get to it in a moment. I, I do want to wish all of you good health. I hope all of you are safe and are feeling well and handling this as well as possible. We wish all of you the best. We also would like to encourage you as you work on, you know, the different parts of the energy sector as you all represent that if there are services and um, assistance that our programs can provide online, if you can participate in the online discussions at the OEP website, um, the library that we have available for all of you that really has the most exhaustive collection of studies, reports, articles, papers, and so forth on energy topics. Um, please take advantage of that um, at all times, of course, but you know, especially now while we're all operating virtually, um, please take advantage of these programs that we're pleased to provide to the energy sector. Um, we are especially excited today by the topic and by our guest. Um, you know, as, as you all know, um, and I think he needs no introduction. Um, General Wesley K. Clark has had one of the most distinguished careers of any American anywhere, um, ranging from his uh, finishing first in his class at West Point all the way to becoming Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, um, an incredibly distinguished military career, but also uh, a very vibrant and currently active business career very active in the energy sector, the chairman of Energy Security Partners, working with many uh, technology companies in the energy sector, um, and also the founder and chairman of um, Renewing America Together, which is a, an organization that's dedicated to promoting, um, reducing the partisan divide and encouraging civil discourse and the, the um, active promotion of civil of civics and policy work. So um, he will be interviewed today by a very distinguished partner at the um, prominent law firm Shepard Mullen, Mark Sunbeck. We are delighted to welcome here today uh, one of the leading experts on energy regulation and policy. He'll be having a conversation with General Clark. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, uh, BP, Broadscale, Con Edison, National Grid, Schiff Harden, and US Grid, and particularly BP, which is underwriting this series for all of their support um, for all the different programs that OEP undertakes. Um, one quick housekeeping um, note, I, what we will be doing is going to the conversation between Mark Sunback and General Clark in a moment. Uh, they will be discussing uh, security and other issues for the next 30 or 35 minutes, at which point we will open it up to questions from the audience. If you do have questions, there's a question box on the right-hand bar. You should type the questions in um, and just hit send. And then if we're able to get to them in the half hour or so we have in the remaining time between um, now and the end of the hour when we'll get everybody sort of promptly off to their next activity, but um, hopefully we'll be able to get to your question. But if you simply type it in and hit send, um, we will be able to uh, queue it up and hopefully get to all of your questions. There's also some material in that right-hand bar about OEP and our programs, um, as well as a help um, document, just in case you have any questions about the webinar platform. So once again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Encourage you to um, ask questions via that um, question bar. And at this point, we're going to turn it over to uh, Mark Sunback and to General Clark for a discussion on energy security. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome again to all the participants, but especially General Clark for offering to share your insights, uh, both from your tour of duty uh, with the military, as well as your post-military career. So just from a a macro perspective to start off, 
given our dependence on the electric grid, and let's let's focus on that to start out, uh, how should we envision the trade-off between security and efficiency when we're thinking about whether we need to harden the grid or make Im further improvements from a security perspective? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a fundamental question, Mark, and thanks for offering me that. As you say, I've been with this for a long time. I was called into the office of the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs back to, well, 25, 25 and a half years ago. And when I was in the Pentagon as a three-star, and um, he said, shut the door. There was a guy with a briefcase and a handcuff to the briefcase, and he opened this up and he said, now look, he said, since the Gulf War, we've learned a lot more about how to do these things. And we could call it network attack. And you might not even have to use bombs. You could use electrons. And this was like the most secret of the secrets of insights. And we were the first ones to do it. Now, the internet was our creation. We, we built it and, um, and I've been around it since it got started one way or another. And we thought we owned it. But in 1999, a couple of Chinese colonels wrote a book that was published called Unrestricted Warfare. And in it, they talk about network attack. Turns out we didn't have a monopoly on the idea. And they talk about a lot of different infrastructures, the pipelines, the, the water, obviously the electricity grid, the transportation network. In other words, uh, everything's on the table in warfare. Now, this is against the Geneva Convention. Understand that. I mean, we created a lot of laws in the last, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and following through up to, into the 1970s to restrict warfare. So it wasn't unrestricted. In fact, the stuff we did during World War II uh, would be illegal today. You can't bomb civilians to eliminate a workforce. Um, you can't bomb civilians to put them under so much moral pressure that they want to overthrow their own government. And yet, that, I mean, the horrible things we did in World War II, um, even um, our great General Curtis LeMay recognized that after the firebombings that he ran in the Pacific campaign, that if we lost the war, he'd be prosecuted as a war criminal in all likelihood. So unrestricted warfare is illegal by the Geneva Convention. And yet, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, what's happened is that just like a, as we're following the COVID crisis and we're looking at the global supply chain, uh, businesses can't help. I mean, the great strength of America is the business community. It's private enterprise. It's the, it's the quest for efficiency. And, um, and so just as we're finding out the downside of that with the medical supply chain and personal protective equipment, we have to consider the same forces are in operation in every sector, including in the electricity sector. And so, Mark, you asked me about, you know, efficiency and security. Of course, we're trading off security for efficiency. I mean, if you look back at the start, and if you saw the, um, um, the, the, the movie about the competition between Edison and, and Westinghouse on electric, you know, called the current affair, um, then when we had little home-based generators and a different one for each city, um, there was nothing you could do other than bomb it maybe to take it out, but we built this incredibly complicated grid structure and we put billions of dollars into each year, billions of dollars of investment in our electricity grid, 500 providers, and every one of them is struggling to be more and more efficient. So um, unless you really work the security on it, what you end up is a, a network that's full of lots of single point failures, limited redundancies, no backups. Uh, hey, I don't need spares here because uh, all I have to do is call Joe and he'll bring it from the next county. And I mean, it's all the things you see in every industry in America today. The same thing's true in the airline industry, by the way. So uh, they run it, they've run it on such tight margins that when there's a mechanical problem, uh, if there's not a local mechanic with the local part, there's no airport. There's no airplane sitting there as a backup. Most of the airports that you can bring over 
in real time. And, and so it is with the electricity grid. And the thing about this is we didn't realize how vulnerable it was until we started to think about it after 9-11, when um, we thought maybe a terrorist would come here and blow up transformers or something. What if he got into Con Ed and, 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 and then you think, okay, well, there's there these guys with truck bombs. You know, they tried to blow up the World Trade Center with a truck bomb in 1993. And so we started to think about it then. But what we didn't realize is we went into the all of the moving from simply um, the computerization of payment records and billing into the computerization of the actual management and operation of the networks through SCADA systems, we didn't realize how vulnerable they were when we put them in. Um, we were thinking about, hey, we don't, don't worry, there's no bombers going to come over here, or the Cold War is over, and yet, um, starting really with our work against the Iranian nuclear threat with so-called Stuxnet in 2008, 2009, people began to look at this and say, you know what? Uh, you can actually affect material things through control of the internet. You can give them signals that cause them to self-destruct. And uh, if you can get in, you can destroy that network completely through these signals. But this technology leaks and so when you develop something you think is really, really super smart, and then you use it, you give everybody else in the world the idea that it can be done. And, uh, and so now it's out there and our networks are vulnerable. Now we're doing a lot to try to keep them from being able to be shut down, but we, um, it's like they say the COVID was probably already in the United States before we knew it was here. Uh, network infiltration is already in place before you know it's there. We know that because there's telltale signatures of it, but we don't know exactly where they are and we don't know what their potential is. And we don't know obviously what the intent is. So uh, there's no question, Mark, we've traded off, we've traded off the security of a totally distributed generation system of 100 years ago or 90 years ago for a system that's incredibly powerful and capable and cost efficient, uh, but it comes with high vulnerabilities. So given that background, what's your assessment of the greatest risks that the grid faces now? Are they physical or they're digital or they're EMP? What where, where do you see the greatest threat coming from? Well, I think that, um, well, I think, first of all, you've got the, the original cyber threat, you know, because people thought they were going to lose the privacy of how much they were spending on their electricity bills, or maybe they were going to get into the accounting systems of a utility and cause it to deposit money in some fake account somewhere. It was about money. But now people realize that on the cyber side, you can actually shut down these networks. So we know we've got state actors probing us 100% of the time. And there are five states out there that have an uh, interest in doing this. There's uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, and, uh, and, 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 and maybe uh, terrorist factions that have the expertise to try to go after this in some way, right? shouldn't call them a state, but that's the sort of five groups that I'm looking at out there and that I hear about constantly. The thing about it is um, you can't always be certain of the attribution of the reconnaissance that's coming in. There's continuous reconnaissance. And by the way, we're doing it against them too. Don't, don't think we aren't. We're doing everything we can to learn every bit of intelligence about every, every one of these countries in case we have to take action against them. And, um, and that's, that's the, the problem with cyber, really. We're, we think we're using it. We think it's helpful to us. Uh, and if you went to our national security agency and said, hey, you, gotta, you guys got to stop this. I mean, wh what are you trying to do here with this? Uh, you're opening us up. And they would say, no, no, we've got the advantage. And, uh, and, and this is a key US asset. It's a domain of warfare. We can't afford not to look at this. This would be like turning off your spy satellites in the sky. You wouldn't know what's happening on the other side, so you have to do this. So therefore, you can't have a treaty 
that protects you from unrestricted warfare. And within our own government, we can't get this treaty out. So I'm looking at state actors as the great threat. And, and what they would do is they would apply some version of the software that's been used successfully in, in 2015 to shut down portions of Ukraine's electricity grid. And you can do it by causing transmer, transformers to overload. You can do it by causing failures in generation. You can do it by shutting circuits. And uh, if you can get system administration authorities in your SCADA systems, you, you can blow it up. Now, as recently as a couple of years ago, I mean, major wind turbine generators in the United States didn't have any cyber protection for their SCADA systems. It, it, it's remarkable how naive we've been on this. And so I have to look at the cyber threat and the threat from state actors as, as real, it's evolving, um, it's a day-by-day -day changing threat. But you mentioned EMP, Mark, and if you want to see something that's overpowering, it would be the EMP threat that could develop against the United States. In, um, I think it was 2017, Kim, Jong Un said that he has the capacity. He has to do up high in the sky. I've got a slow network connection that I'm pushing ignore. We still okay, Mark? Yes. Am I still coming through, or did we lose it? So, um, so we know North Korea has talked about electromagnetic pulse. So let me just talk about that for a minute, um, because I'm working with the um, uh, American University Institute AUI and. Uh, a great group and here we're putting together another EMP report that we hope will get out in time to influence the national uh, political campaign and get even more attention on EMP than it has had thus far. Look, compared to COVID, uh, EMP is uh, a thousand times worse. If it hit the United States, um, it could literally turn off the electric grid for most of the country. And in turning off the electric grid, it would not just interrupt your electric lighting, but your refrigeration, the ability to, to communicate, the ability to trans, transport goods, it would turn off the electric pumps in the filling station so you can't get fuel. I mean, it, it, the airlines couldn't fly. Uh, I mean, it would be a complete catastrophe and there'd be little islands for a while that may have their own generator that was had diesel fuel in it. It might run for two or three days at a hospital or something like this and keep the hospital going provided it wasn't connected to the grid and also burned out in the process. So they, these are really horrifying end of the world type scenarios. You call out the National Guard immediately and you have riots in the street and all those people who are buying ammunition for their assault rifles would feel you know, that they had really made a great investment because uh, you'd have widespread uh, rioting and looting and disobedience for this to happen. Now, we've been aware of this for a long time. And during the Cold War, we actually did very, very little about it. We discovered it from our own nuclear testing program back in the 1950s and 60s. There was one high altitude test that was run in 1962 that uh, out in the Pacific that burned out a bunch of transformers and telephone lines in Hawaii 900 miles away. And so uh, we knew we had a problem. Uh, we didn't do much about it. The Soviets and the Russians following uh, taking Soviet technology uh, tried to weaponize EMP with high explosives. And uh, so that's a factor that's out there now. And we've gotten a lot better in the military in terms of demanding we protect ourselves. We didn't have the same problem when we used vacuum tube technology, but with transistors, what happens is the first flash of the nuclear explosive sends out a burst of gamma radiation and neutrons that excite and send out cascades of uh, instantaneous that will burn out um, solid state electronics if they're exposed. That's, that's called uh, in the technology E1. And it's a, like a nanosecond surge that goes out there. Uh, but a nuclear uh, explosion itself, if it's high altitude or low altitude, has secondary effects. And um, at, at high altitude, the debris interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and sends out 
um, a, uh, a, both a, a blast and a, what they call a heave, which is a set of long waves that come out that get on the nation's uh, transmission lines, which act as antennas to the EMP. And then they send a second surge through these lines that can burn out transformers and do other things. This happens within a second or so of the, after the explosion. Um, and surface explosions have um, strong electromagnetic effects. So this is really the worst case scenario, Mark. And uh, starting in 2005, 2006, uh, people began to really talk about this in the United States because we could see the nuclearization programs going on overseas. We didn't stop the North Korean nuke program in time back in the 90s. And, uh, and it was always, it's like a poor man's uh, second strike capability or first strike capability. You know, you may not have enough weapons to destroy the United States conventionally, but you only have to put one of them up there at high altitude and you can do a whole lot of damage. And, uh, and so that's why the, the high altitude EMP threat is uh, so significant as we're looking at um, the number of nations, particularly the rogue states that might have these nuclear weapons. So that's been the concern. Now, um, President Trump has released information on, has, has released uh, instructions on this. There's been a lot of congressional discussion of it, but trying to protect from EMP is so complicated and so potentially expensive Actually, for years, the electric utility industry is like, uh, don't, 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 don't touch this. You know, it's fifty billion dollars a year. We're investing already. Please don't get us into this because it's like an infinite financial sink. And um, and so, uh, but we're coming to terms with it as we should. You know, we saw back in the nineties um, that we were going to have a medical. Uh, uh, we had a contagion problem then. With, with, with viruses and things like this. And we, we signed the Biological Warfare Convention back in the 1970s, but the Soviets never abided by it. And, um, and they weaponized Marburg and Ebola and uh, got defected. It was on CBS 60 Minutes about 15 years ago. They showed one of the Soviet scientists who had weaponized this virus and pricked his finger and he was dying of the virus. And we knew after the anthrax scare in 2003 that we were vulnerable. And so we built a, the BARDA organization inside the Department of Health and Human Services so we could react to COVID. Um, and we worked really scrupulously on the Ebola epidemics that occurred a couple of times in Africa. And we had a pandemic response force, but, and we had a stockpile for personal protective equipment, but we don't fully resource this. And um, when administrations change, priorities change and intensities of interest change. And, uh, and so we lost a lot of the preparation for that. Same thing can happen to us as we're talking about EMP and cyber protection on the grid. So it's something that is so awful to contemplate that you just have to keep, um, keep uh, pushing and gnawing at it and working at it to get people's attention because you don't want to think about this. And yet it could happen. And if it does happen, it'll be far worse than COVID. So what, what kind of concrete remedial steps and resources are we talking about? Are we disbanding uh, or minimizing dig digital communication with assets and reverting to traditional analog methods or retaining those as backup? Is the military going to a series of microgrids for various bases. What are the, the concrete strategies that are susceptible so, to implementation? Well, first of all, you know, you have to define what, what the threat is. And so for both the cyber threat and the EMP threat, uh, being able to isolate portions of the grid is really important. So a lot of us have looked at this and the military has more or less moved into the policy of saying, look, our, our our post camps and stations and, and bases in the United States should be self-sufficient electrically. So we should be able to survive for a certain period of time, cut off from the grid. And um, then we would form the basis for national recovery in the event of some catastrophe, like an EMP catastrophe, because we know there's no resources available to protect the whole industry right now. But if you could 
have islands of security. And then the next step behind, beyond this would be to take the U.S. grid structure and then separate it into 20 or 30 different um, uh, sections that would be connected by the right kind of cutoffs so that uh, a, a power surge would not be able to move throughout the entire grid. And so you might lose some section of two or three states, but the neighboring states wouldn't be hit as hard. And, um, and then you have varying levels of protection for different assets in the grid system. And you have a certain amount of spares that are in place. And you have authorities that enable um, the, and authorize the sharing of these spares between different utility companies. I mean, <laughs> it's so technical. It is so complex. You could hardly design a worse system for national security than this. And remember, I mean, you're dealing with the electricity industry. So A, um, it's expensive. B, the, it's a cost input for everybody. So it's not like people, you know, bring you out back and say, look at my beautiful electric generator. No, they want to minimize the cost. And so they do not, uh, you know, put it up there to show it off. And, um, and so you're constantly fighting this battle of efficiency versus security. But um, there are steps that are underway to deal with EMP. We just can't lose sight of this uh, because at the, at the heart of it, you've got to have um, real protection for your most sensitive immediate assets. And that means steel seamless caging around it. That means double surge protection devices. That means um, the ability to isolate, uh, to seal off doors, to have waveguides that deflect these um, electromagnetic pulses against walls and so forth, so they don't go inside the facility. And um, so all this is incredibly expensive construction. And it's, um, it's remedial construction that makes it even worse because it's not greenfield in most cases. So um, there are, in the last two years, we've published standards that are out there for uh, threat levels of protection uh, from EMP based on the criticality of the resource. But uh, that makes sense maybe for the U.S. government and continuity of government planning. But for those of us who live in America who aren't part of the government, <laughs> my refrigerator is essential. <laughs> and, and after it's out for a couple of days and all the produce in there spoils and I can't go to the store and buy anything and the fuel is cut off um, and, uh, and, and you can't get to the hospital and the traffic lights don't work. And, uh, you know, it may not look like to a national security specialist that this is essential, but it will feed incredible civil turmoil in the United States. So uh, the further we can go toward protecting everything from EMP, the greater our ability to deal with the crisis. And if we've learned one thing out of COVID is that sometimes the worst, worst case, I don't say the absolute worst, but bad scenarios can happen. And I hope that we'll take the lesson from COVID and translate it into other kinds of societal threats that um, people write about, but most of us don't think about in our day-to-day -day lives. How do, we, how do we integrate the Internet of Things and presumably increased behind retail meter devices, whether it's solar rooftop or other measures, storage, in this already incredibly complex network system and harden it sufficiently so that we don't create new doorways for additional digital access. Yeah, but but, but they're already there, Mark. That's the, that's yeah. the point. You know? And um, the Internet of Things, unfortunately, we've been talking about it for several years now, but we didn't stop it. <laughs> it, it just keeps going. And um, it's going very, very quickly because it's efficient and it makes sense and people like it. People even want it for their homes. They want to be able to check on security, see the camera at the front door and do all these things uh, and it all gets connected. So, uh, yeah, we're in danger on this. Now, how do we do it? Well, first of all, um, like a lot of the security measures on the grid, we're playing catch up. 
And so um, for new devices, we really should have standards on what, what they can do and signatures, and they shouldn't be allowed to transmit willy-nilly. They should be impossible to take over and commandeer through um, breaking and entering cyber-wise, uh, but they're not. And so they can send out signals that can uh, cause damage. Look, I mean, even in your own home, if you're connected and you've got your utilities connected, uh, there's nothing to prevent someone who really wants to from doing something that will mess up your heating and air conditioning system and uh, and do damage in your home. And um, using that as an access and going back through and into the larger grid, that's the way you get access into some level of control. So you've got to put filters in, you've got to really control system administration, um, you've got to try to get licenses for the what can be in an internet of things, and get them on there, and um, you've got to um, do um, cyber inspection of kind of what's on the net and continue to do red team analysis of this. All that's going on, but um, but we're chasing, we're not in front of it. Yeah, do you, do you there was a, a study done, I think it was by the University of Vermont uh, last year that suggested that possibly the weakest link in the, the network might be smaller utilities. Does that correspond to your experience of investment in resources and dedication to um, robust protections? Yes, but you know, I'd always say the weakest link is really the human link in all these things, because in every system, uh, there's somebody who can do things. And if that person is not adequately trained and not vigilant, um, they will get um, so-called spearfished, or they'll go to what they call watering holes, where they're looking at a new type of equipment and they'll download something that's contaminated and that opens up their system. That's more likely to happen in the smaller, in the edge of the utility system, rather than in the major bulk power providers. It's more likely to happen in the distribution system because the resources are, are thinner out there, the backup is less. Um, and you have 50 different states here, all with their different public utility commissions and trying to juggle things like public accountability, cyber protection, responsiveness to the FERC and NERC guidelines, investment rates, the politics of raising rates. It is an incredibly complicated system. Some people say that really gives you a lot of protection because um, that means that uh, like a state actor can't just say, oh, I figured out Delaware, now I can take down the whole of the United States. But um, actually, that may not be true because the network is interconnected in such a way that you can, to some extent, create waterfall effects that go out, outside these, um, these areas. And the diversity of the states, um, I mean, you've got a lot of people really doing the best they can do and really smart people and who are really conscious. You know, if you're one of these, if you're under NERC supervision, or FERC and you fail, you, you, you don't meet your gate and your standard to get him a billion dollar a day fine. That's enough to get the attention of any utility company. And so people are really sensitive to it. They've gotten a lot better since the Ukraine experience in 2015. But um, we know that, um, that the continuous reconnaissance is underway and that these smaller utilities are the easiest targets to get into. Do, do you think that blockchain offers any material protection from some of these threats or it doesn't seem like it's advancing the ball? You know, the thing about it is that blockchains become like the cure to everything now. And I was at the <laughs> United Nations last year and giving a talk on, they asked me to come up with on blockchain and climate change. And we're talking about blockchain for immunity passports for COVID. So, I mean, blockchain is a distributed ledger system. So if you wanna see whoever got into like, and whatever was done in your systems administrator file, maybe you could set up a blockchain system that would do that. But 
I mean, it's, it's not that utilities have never thought about something like this. It's a question of, you know, is this more efficient? Is this safer than the existing systems? I was talking to one of my cyber friends uh, when I thought about this question before our, our meeting today, Mark, because you'd asked me some of these questions to think about them. And uh, of course, people are going to apply blockchain to this, but every utility has a different system of cyber protection, and access control, and so forth. So you really have to, uh, to sharpen it up and ask, what is it exactly that a locked distributed ledger can do to strengthen control of the system? I was down with um, with uh, one of the cyber companies I work with, and we were down with the um, with um, uh, energy company in Texas. And um, the CEO was telling us, he says, I, I worry every night about the security of this of our of our control systems because <clears throat> someone can get in and blow up my plants, and uh, and I'm really worried about it. And how do they access it? But believe me, a lot of real talent is in this, so it's the human element that is the greatest concern to me. It's the, it's the mistake. It's the not closing the door and locking it, so to speak, cyber-wise. Maybe blockchain can help with that. Um, and I know that all the blockchain apostles out there are coming to the cyber world and the electricity world and saying, let us use blockchain here. <laughs> hey, bring it on. If we can find a way to make it safer, and better we should use it you know you could use a blockchain system with a set of permissions and so you could have ironclad linear lock control of exactly everything that's done and you could require in order to get into that system that it pass certain gates like you can't um you can't change the power output more than x amount x percent in so many seconds or whatever it is you're trying to protect wherever you set your equipment safeguards operationally and you could embed that with a blockchain system of control but it would be it wouldn't be that there's no control there now it would just have to prove that it's better more reliable more secure and one of the things we know is that anything that's done with bits and bytes can be undone with bits and bytes. I mean, that is a fact. Even blockchain, there's just there's nothing that is made by mankind can't be fixed by mankind given time, incentive, and resources. This is why this is such a challenge for us because what we're doing is we're in a commercial space that's totally civilianized and we're going in real time warfare against active opponents government empowered and government directed just mark you know we're talking about the grid so think of it this way china recently a chinese company of course a private company in china had excess drones and so they gave them to um, a lot of uh, local localities in the united states uh, and so they fly over they have cameras and stuff like this and they're connected to the chinese cloud now that's only so they can be controlled and that's only so they can be helpful to Americans. But we don't know where that data is going. And um, there, you know, I've been on the inside <laughs> with some pretty smart people, but I don't think we're any smarter than they are. And if we had some excess drones to give out to China and Russia that would fly around and take pictures, we, <laughs> we would probably have a way of taking that imagery back. So we always were in an interactive, uh, real-time competition against state actors, and we're trying to provide a, an essential public service that's reliable and at lowest cost. Boy, that's a heavy lift. Yes, Mark, excuse me. I hate to I hate to jump in on the conversation, but I know we have a bunch of questions from our attendees, so I wanted to. Um, shift over to that so we can see uh, what people have queued up. So I'll turn it over to Kevin to um, read the questions that are coming in from the audience. And thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for that, General Clark, and thank you, Mark, for the moderating so far. Uh, we do have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I will paraphrase the first one since there are numerous questions regarding microgrids. Um, you did talk a little bit about that earlier and their potential and uh, you know ability to kind of insulate us from an attack. So a lot of the questions coming in do uh, they would like to know: Do you see a future in which these energy systems are you know part of the grid at a larger scale? And is there a way, in your opinion, that these could be uh, promoted or um, increase the rate at which we're uh, creating microgrids? Well, I think, you know, microgrids are good for security, but they're not good for the utility industry, to be honest with you. And there's a trade-off in this. And uh, so what you've got to have is government leadership. And in the whole cyberspace, we've always had a problem with government leadership in this because business doesn't like cyber. And, uh, you know, it, it's like after 9-11, when you went to New York before 9-11, you could walk into any skyscraper and just uh, push the elevator button, go up and see who you wanted to see. After that, businesses reluctantly invested in the security badge system and uh, and passes and turnstiles and there's a counter and you've got to show your ID and who are you supposed to see? And it, that's a cost element. That's not a, an efficiency promoter. And so these microgrids, um, in some cases, they save businesses money, but the utility models still run basically on power provided. And so for major utilities, they have been, uh, they've been really uh, have mixed views on these microgrids to say that, that that's the best way to say it. Um, so it's got to come in through the national security hatch and that means you've got to have government support behind it. And uh, to do that, you've got to find a way to make it conducive to uh, the major power companies. So they got to like it. So they, have to, they have to have some ownership in it and some profit from it. Great. Uh, moving on here, you mentioned earlier um, that there are steps or uh, procedures we can put in place in our own homes to pr uh, protect our own systems from uh, cyber attacks. Question came in, uh, what steps or actions have you taken to protect your home or office against cyber attacks? Uh, is there anything you'd recommend for the average person in society to do? Um, first of all, you know, in my home, we don't actually have the home connected to the grid except through, um, I have, you know, an ethernet in the home and I have my computer on it and uh, we watch Netflix, but um, but I'm I'm not modernized. I can't turn my refrigerator on and off or, or adjust the heating system or open the garage doors or, or lock and unlock uh, with it. So I think that the further you go down this, the more you need things like firewalls. That's the simplest means that, that people have on this is a firewall. But you also have to watch just the basics of it is um, your password and double authentication. It's, it's the basic procedures for cybersecurity that you do for your home. I don't think there's a technological fix for it, a hardware fix right now that you can afford, that you want. Now, we do have hardware fixes. And um, so, uh, Mark, can I talk about one of those? Sure. Or, yeah. I mean, or Bill, I, I want to talk about it because it's a company I'm affiliated with and I don't want to, I, I don't want to, um, to uh, go off the reservation here, but I'm very proud of this. One of the, our problems in the military was that um, we had two separate nets. We had a cyber net and a, and a um, that was a secure net called a super net. And then we had a non-secure net called nipper net, non-secure. and um, you had to have an air gap between them. You couldn't have them on the same computer. They had completely different wiring systems. And uh, so one of the companies I work with now has has been able to put all this in a little tiny box. Um, it's not scaled for home use yet, but it is available as a data protection system and a way of uh, wrapping data and securing data. And so uh, the, the technology is coming and maybe someday it will be here. That you can have ironclad hardware protection for everything that is right now. Sure. 
Well, moving back to discuss uh, EMPs a little further, we had the question come in from Rebecca Sussman. Would the act of shutting down another country's grid be viewed as an act of war? And would Stuxnet have qualified under the weapons ban under the Geneva Convention? It's essentially a reusable bomb. How would international law view these devices? You know, that's one of those questions I think no one wants to raise because it's really inconvenient. And um, uh, first of all, we didn't go after, with Stuxnet, we didn't go after a civilian group. So we didn't violate the Geneva Conventions. Uh, could you consider it an act of war? Uh, that's all, that's debatable. And so um, the way you would have to do this is you would, um, if you were the receiving party, you would declare it an act of war. Uh, and then you'd be at war and uh, legally. And if that's what you want to do, and there's a political advantage at home to do that, I guess that's what you do. Um, we didn't declare that we'd undertaken a war against Iraq, Iran at that point, because we didn't see any advantage. We tried to keep it secret. And um, the company, countries that um, are the targets normally like to keep it secret also because they don't want to advertise their vulnerability. You know, this is the, this is the really terrible thing about cyber is it's like the submarine service. It's run silent, run deep. Stuff happens. The victims don't want to admit it because it damages their reputation, their business reputation. It takes down their stock value. We've had to pass laws to encourage this information to be shared. And even then, it's usually not shared publicly, uh, especially from the financial system where we know there's hundreds of millions, billions of dollars stolen. And, uh, and you wouldn't put money in that bank if you knew it. Uh, but things happen. And, um, and so for that reason, this is a sort of murky gray area. So we've tried to say as a deterrent in the United States, A, we've declared cyber as a domain of warfare, just like air, land, sea, space and cyber are now domains of warfare. And, um, and so we have to prepare for them. We have to resource for it. We have to understand it. And then we've tried to say that um, if we were um, hit with a massive cyber attack, we could respond with kinetics as well as cyber. And so that would be a conventional or nuclear response. And uh, like many things in deterrence theory, you don't want to get too specific about it because you don't want to draw a red line and give your adversary a chance to walk just up to the red line and then say, okay, but you know, I didn't hit your red line. You're not going to do anything to me. And, uh, you know, you get yourself in a lot of problems, as we saw in Syria in 2013, you draw red lines. So you don't want to draw red lines, but you want to leave a certain ambiguity in there. But we've made it clear that we would, as a nation, if we had a major cyber attack, we would consider that an act of warfare against the United States. Sure. Next question here comes from David Sandalow. How do you assess our vulnerability for the remainder of this year? Does the pandemic increase our vulnerability? How about the election or the transition period between the election and inauguration? First, uh, David, uh, good to hear from you. We got to catch up. I do think that we're um, increasingly vulnerable, not just because of the pandemic, because the pandemic is, yes, you've got a few Navy crewmen on ships that are, uh, that, that, that are testing positive for coronavirus. And we did pull the ships in and we're trying to protect the health and welfare of our sailors. But um, it's not that, it's that international tensions really are on the rise. So you have um, Vladimir Putin who was preparing to be uh, ordained as a president for life in Russia. All he needed was a constitutional commitment, amendment and he couldn't pull the Russian Duma together and get the vote out in such a way that he could be elected president for life. He added tension to it. And then they canceled the big uh, victory in Europe, May Day celebration that was going to celebrate 75 years of victory over World War II. And he's got a tremendous COVID problem at home. Um, so I don't know why doctors are, keep falling out of windows in Russia, but three in a row have fallen out now and talking about COVID. So um, there's obviously a lot of problems there. What we expect is that those problems, they could be distracting and he could just turn inward or he could attempt to distract from the problems by turning outward and creating a crisis. In China, what we've done is um, we've actually decided to increase our um, rhetorical 
targeting China during this election season. So this is one of these strange things where Democrats and Republicans mostly agree that China hasn't been the nicest actor in the international space. And um, so um, President Trump has found a strong Democratic support when he's gone after uh, efforts to pin the blame on China for various things. Not always in terms of putting sanctions on, but also, but more in terms of saying, you know, China's taking advantage of us. China's not a fair, doesn't deal fairly. They didn't live up to their expectations that we expected of them when they joined the World Trade Organization. The, the image that Bill Clinton gave the world of China is it modernized, it's going to become more democratic. It's not. It's more repressive. It's got two, two or 20 million people out in Xinjiang province. Uh, who are being uh, persecuted and uh, put in these large internment camps. So there's massive human rights violations. Seems we're having a minor technical difficulty here. Let's give it just a moment to see if that clears up for us. The thing about China is that that's just beyond Corona. The thing about China is that China always one expected that. We knew that they were on the defensive from the Soviet Union, but we didn't expect them to invade North Vietnam, and they had an eight-year war against Vietnam. And um, it was a General real Clark, if I could interject for just a moment, we had a quick break in the audio feed. Would you mind repeating your most recent answer a little bit? Repeat what I just said on China. We don't yes, expect please. them to be able to act, but when they start feeling under pressure and they're losing, they do act. So what you've got is rising tensions between with Russia and China competing with the United States. And this is exacerbated during the political election campaign because Democrats and Republicans are working more together. To, and, and with coronavirus, got the world sort of ganging up on China. So uh, my friends on the inside are pretty worried about uh, this rising tension, what it might mean for stability in Asia, let's say. Sure. Sort of a follow-up on that question. Uh, this is from Robert Hallman. What is the single most important step President Trump or the president-elect in November can take to address cybersecurity threats to the U.S. power grid? I think, um, I think, I mean, the first thing you do is you have a, probably put a high-powered commission together to uh, review progress that's been made and update uh, presidential directives and compliance with the directives and what needs to be done. Because um, I don't think you can sort of march into office and then issue a bunch of pronouncements based on what's been done by your um, election team. So what you're going to want to do is get the most eminent uh, people in the field together for a short study that will result in legislation that empowers or uh, impels the utility industry and uh, cyber security providers to strengthen our cyber protection. Great. Uh, let's see here, bear with me one moment. Uh, a question, do you believe a carbon tax would be the most economically efficient method to encourage the development and construction of more secure energy infrastructure? Or do you see another method as being preferable? Yeah, I think that, I think the carbon, you have to use a market system. So um, you have to use a carbon tax because no one's smart enough to be able to pick a winner and say, oh, we're going to all do hydrogen propulsion, or we're all going to do, uh, we're all going to just use batteries. But uh, you know, the Chinese have a new polymer battery, so we're all going to use a new polymer battery instead of, and so you can't do that. What you have to do is put the carbon tax on, make it a whole of system carbon tax. So it's not just how much oil, but how much carbon went into production of the steel or whatever. So you take the big picture, look at this thing, and then escalate the tax over time. And uh, if business believes that that tax is going to escalate, they will invest to maintain their uh, business in business. They'll innovate, they'll adopt, they'll discard, they'll depreciate, they'll amortize, they'll do whatever they ta it takes to survive. And you'll get the best system that way. Whereas if you try to I mean, I don't want to label it as a green revolution, but just come in and say, hey, oh, that's it. Okay, no more oil and gas. You're out. Uh, and you throw a lot of people out of business. And then uh, you're trying to start over. Uh, you're going to have the same kind of confusion that you're seeing today in the chasing after personal protective equipment in COVID. You're going to have a lot of uh, 
young people who are very enthusiastic but who don't have their hands on how to make business and sustain it. We have the greatest system through private enterprise and the, and the market system in the world. It really works. And uh, with cyber, it, it will work the same way. Mark, one of the questions you were asking me is about legislation on cyber and uh, and how you uh, whether you should cap damages for, for certain cyber failures. And uh, my view would be you've got to be really careful about doing that, just like you have to be really careful about locking in certain standards for cyber protection, because that's the floor. What you want is you want the market forces, innovation in the private economy to keep driving the level of protection up. So uh, right now you've got companies that will insure for data loss. The question is, you know, what's the right cyber protection and, and through that market mechanism and the fear of lawsuits and the concern about losing control of sensitive data, you will drive the progress we need to keep us in front. That's what makes the American economy so dynamic. And that's the critical advantage in national security terms that we have over our principal adversaries because they're not that way. Great. Looks like we do have time for just one more question for you. This is from Elizabeth Halliday. Thank you, General Clark and Mark. Last year, members of both parties voted to protect the security of the communications system. How can we build upon this bipartisan support to protect key energy assets, both hard assets and the software systems? And if possible, please also discuss the vetting process for cybersecurity vendors to ensure their ongoing trustworthiness. I think you have to um, continue to use the um, you're, you're in a dynamic competition here, and um, and the way that uh, progress occurs in cyber is through um, challenge and response. And so, if you want to protect the communication system um, from cyber threats, or you want to push cyber forward, you always have to look at challenge and response. So let's take 5G today. So what 5G has done is reduces latency, increases bandwidth. It opens lots more room for mischief. And so uh, the United States government has taken the lead in first trying to keep Huawei out. And then secondly, looking at ways to protect ourselves. We didn't mandate national protection. And so we're relying on the innovation of individual firms to do the protection. But it's the challenge and response in the private sector that works again and again. One of the things I found most surprising, I was in DC uh, at a cyber meeting about four years ago with a big investment firm. And um, I was listening to a former head of NSA said, look, we, we, we can't do this. We're not good enough at NSA to do this. He said, all the talents in the private sector. And I thought about it, I said, no, it's right. Because the talent is in the private sector because people are willing to work incredible hours and uh, take incredible personal risks and put forth effort in order to achieve financial reward. I'm not saying that's the way everything should be motivated. I mean, I served a long time in the Army and it wasn't about money. But I have seen in the private sector that um, if you offer rewards, people will struggle and really work to achieve that. And so you can't keep the most qualified people in government service in the cyberspace. There's too much commercial opportunity out there. And that's the strength that we have to build on in protecting our communications. Thank you, General Clark. I hate to have to jump in here because this has been such a remarkable conversation, but I really want to thank Mark Sunback of Shepard Mullen and our thanks to you, General Clark, for really the invaluable sobering insights. But I also think it underscores um, something we mentioned at the outset, the organization that General Clark founded recently, Renew America Together, um, which is really dedicated to reducing partisan gridlock and partisan division and promoting discourse and unity in addressing the kind of problems that we've been discussing today. As you all know, that coincides very closely with what OEP is all about, which is to bring people of different views together in civil discourse and work on problems together as opposed to the kind of polariz excuse me, polarization and partisanship we've seen. So um, I encourage all of you to um, uh, urge those of you in your network, we will make this um, recording available. And uh, for those people who had conflicts and couldn't make it, 
I hope they'll be able to take the time to listen in because uh, I think that the thoughts and um, vision that was shared today is something that would be important for everyone to hear. Uh, thanks again to all of you for being part of this. Um, we will have uh, communication to you about the next one in our series. Again, thanks to BP for underwriting it. Uh, and thanks once again to Mark Sunback and to General Clark for taking the time today to be with us. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, General, thank you.